Enormous. Early in 1942, a young Soviet physicist named Georgi Flerov sat in the library of a military base in southwestern Russia, flipping through a tall stack of physics journals from the United States. When the Germans invaded, Flerov had put his studies aside to serve in the Soviet Air Force. But he couldn't stop thinking about fission, so when he had a free moment, he snuck off to the library to read of the newest discoveries. I had hoped to look through the latest papers on the fission of uranium, he said. Up until that point, American physics magazines had been filled with articles on new experiments and theories about fission. Suddenly, there was nothing. This silence is not the result of an absence of research, Flaroff warned his government. In a word, the seal of silence has been imposed, and this is the best proof of the vigorous work that is going on now abroad. Flaroff guessed right. The work being done by Oppenheimer and others on the Uranium Committee was top secret. The Soviet Union and the United States were allies in World War II, but that's because they were fighting common enemies, not because they liked each other. Even more distressing to Flerov was the idea of a German atomic bomb. Germany had first-class scientists, he said, and significant supplies of uranium ore. If Hitler got his hands on atomic bombs, that would be the end of the Soviet Union. To Soviet physicists like Flerov, this made it vitally important that the Soviet Union develop its own atomic bomb. But the war was making this impossible. Russian forces stopped the German advance just short of Moscow, but the two massive armies were still slugging it out along a battlefront stretching 1,500 miles from north to south. Soviet scientists had to abandon fission experiments to work instead on weapons that could be used right away. The message to Soviet leaders was clear. If the Soviets were going to get an atomic bomb any time in the near future, they were going to have to steal it. This was a job for the KGB. In March 1942, Semyon Semyonov and his fellow KGB agents in New York got a coded telegram from the Moscow headquarters explaining the task. Germany and the USA are frantically working to obtain uranium, Moscow warned, and use it as an explosive to make bombs of enormous destructive power, and to all appearances, this problem is quite close to practical solution. It is essential that we take up this problem in all seriousness. Soviet spies and American cities began working on what they called agent cultivation. In tradecraft, cultivation means gathering information on a potential source feeling him out to see if he might be convinced to cooperate. This was a tough task since Soviet agents didn't know which American scientists were working on the atomic bomb. Suddenly, in late March, the KGB got a break. One night on the New York City subway, a KGB courier named Zalmond Franklin ran into an old friend, Clarence Hiskey. Hiskey was a chemist and professor at Columbia University. The two had gone to college together in the 1930s. Both had been sympathetic to the Soviet Union and members of the Communist Party. The friends went to dinner and talked over old times. He decided to walk me to the subway, Franklin reported to his KGB contact. Our conversation on the way is what leads to the reason for this report. As they strolled, Hiskey shocked Franklin by saying, Imagine a bomb dropped in the center of this city, which would destroy the entire city. Franklin laughed. There is such a bomb, Hiskey blurted out. I'm working on it. Trying to appear only casually interested, Franklin asked for a few more details. Hiskey explained that he and other scientists were working with desperate haste to build an atomic bomb. It would be the most powerful weapon ever produced. The Germans, he added, were probably far ahead on the bomb. Then, after this burst of top-secret information, Hiskey went silent. Hiskey was sorry he told me about this, Franklin reported, and swore me to silence. Vasily Zarubin, the top KGB agent in New York City, telegraphed Franklin's report to headquarters in Moscow. Moscow responded quickly, telling Zarubin the information is of great interest to us, and attaching a long list of technical questions about fission and bomb-making. Zarubin gave the list to Franklin, ordering Franklin to get answers from his friend. Franklin went to Hiskey's apartment, but faced a major obstacle. Hiskey's wife was there. 
Franklin was under strict KGB orders not to discuss the subject of atomic bombs in front of anyone but Hiskey. The three sat down to dinner. At no time did Clarence bring up the subject of his work, Franklin reported, and following instructions, I did not mention the subject. Franklin tried to get Hiskey alone, with no success. His wife was present the entire evening, explained Franklin. That proved to be Franklin's one and only chance. Hiskey was soon transferred to the University of Chicago. When a Soviet agent in Chicago made contact with Hiskey, the meeting was observed by FBI agents. The FBI informed the U.S. Army that Hiskey had been spotted with a suspected Soviet agent. Hiskey suddenly found himself drafted into the Army and shipped to a remote military base in the Northwest Territories of Canada, far from atomic bomb secrets. Hiskey was never given an explanation. He knew better than to ask for one. Hiskey's story illustrates just how hard it was for Soviet spies to get at American secret. It was difficult because we always felt we were under FBI surveillance, said KGB agent Alexander Feklazov. From the moment I arrived in New York, I was always shadowed as soon as I stepped outside. Still, the Soviets were absolutely determined to steal the bomb. It was such a high priority they codenamed the project Enormous, Russian for Enormous. But Enormous could go nowhere until the KGB got a reliable source inside the American bomb project. With this goal in mind, Moscow headquarters made up a list of top American scientists to target for cultivation. Of the leads we have, Moscow informed its agents in the United States, we should consider it essential to cultivate the following people. Then came the names. The people on the list were all top scientists the Soviets suspected might be in on the bomb work. They were all known to have been sympathetic to communism before the war. The first name on the list was Robert Oppenheimer.